Like, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start right now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Rob Rosovich. Rob, are you ready to be great today? I am indeed. Rob has been actively involved in tech for nearly 30 years, from building a top e-commerce site in a time when e-commerce was still in its infancy, to establishing what is now known as Amazon's AWS Internet of Things. He is a CTO, ThinkLogix, which provides a low-code platform built on AWS, Google, and Azure to accelerate innovation and system development by a factor of 50 or more, reduce costs and risk, and deliver future-proof applications. With Robert C. Cho, ThinkLogix was awarded the 2018 IoT Platforms Leadership Award and has become an advanced tier technology partner for Amazon Web Services. When he's not at the forefront of IoT, Rob is maintaining his cattle ranch in Central Oregon. Rob, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate you having us. So, Rob, first question, what is ranch life like? Like me, I imagine like it's a dust of darn work, hard work, you know, go on, grind all day. What's it actually like? <laughs> well, ranch life is definitely, uh, it's, uh, it's currently 9 a.m. my time and I'm ready for lunch. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> it starts, uh, it starts early in the morning uh, when you're doing when you're doing ranch and and tech, uh, you know the uh, ranch life starts I usually starts about five, um, and we do morning chores. I have uh, I feed about three hundred head of cows, and we uh, we actually pick up the spent grains from the brewers in town in a little town called Bend, Oregon. We feed that to the cows. So there's a lot of uh, coordination and picking up, and then. Um, you know, regular farm work. And then I usually start my tech job about, you know, <clears throat> eight or nine. And, you know, and then in the evenings, you have another set of chores that you do to uh, go in. So it's very long days, but uh, I have to say they're, they're both fulfilling. They each kind of, each industry kind of uh, helps the other one. You know, it's nice to be able to get away from the, the tech for a while. And it's also nice to get away from the farm for a while. And you like, do, do you break it down where you work 40 hours on each one each week or does this fluctuate? Uh, I don't remember the last time I ever worked 40 hours on anything. It just seems like it's constant, you know. Um, we always kind of, uh, a ranch is, is like, is very much like, um, you know, running a, a technology company. You, you do what needs to be done and when it needs to be done. So um, it would be, it it's definitely has uh, more than 40 hours on each one of them, but um, I, I also try and squeeze in enough time in there to, you know, have a family life and you know, maybe go out and have a, a dinner every now and then. So, and, and this, this ranch has actually been your, your family for like three generations, right? It has. Yeah. I am actually the third generation rancher is my grandfather who homesteaded it. So we are, uh, 102 years old this year. We were, um, founded in 1919. Um, and we're the, um, the county that we live in, it's called Deschutes County in, in Oregon. And we're the oldest ranch in, in Deschutes County that has been, you know, continuously operated by the same family for that long. So and what's the main business of your ranch? You, you, do you sell cattle for beef or what do you, what do you, what's the main business? We do, we do. Um, so the, <clears throat> you know, we have a lot of micro breweries in town. And like I say, we pick up the spent grains and we feed that to the cows and then we actually sell the uh, ground beef back to the breweries and so when you come into town and have a burger and a beer you're actually eating a burger raised on the beer you're drinking um so we actually provide a service to the breweries because they have to get rid of that that mash that's left over it's a byproduct from making beer um and it also makes for a, a real high quality uh beef product so and we also sell direct to consumers as well so we are we're definitely a uh, a beef a beef business I'm guessing like when, and how do you bring on new cattle? Is it just, just is the calves being born? That's how you like replenish your stock or do you like bring in cattle from someplace else? Yeah. So I do, we actually do both. So we do have cow, cow, what they call a cow, calf operation. Um, cows come in, the cows are born here on the property and um, they'll raise, they're raised, you know, all the way through to maturity here. Uh, but I also, you know, um, bring in other uh, feed, other people's cows. So they'll have, somebody will have, um, some cows that they need to get fattened up. So bring them over because I have the, the feed source, but it's all in central Oregon. We don't really bring cows outside of, um, seriously, you know, cause I've been in, we've been doing this for so long. It's my cousins and my uncles and everybody else that's bringing in cows to, for us to feed. So. 
And how, how does that bring in a staff work? Do you, do you bring in staff at a regular basis or you just had a, a crew there like forever who's been like with you for a while? Uh, I have, I have two hands that kind of run the, run the operation. Um, you know, one really manages the, the feed and the cattle and the other one manages the, um, the delivery side of, you know, delivering beef and, you know, the butchering process and those kinds of things. And then my daughter actually kind of runs the marketing and operations of the, of the business in terms of interacting with the customer. So it takes, you know, three full-time people and me to, to keep the operation going. So yeah, you, you, you basically have two full-time jobs, the ranch, the CTO, and of course, yeah. other stuff you do, like, you know, you know, family life, other obligations. I do. Yeah. It's um, about can you talk some about like, like some people like you kind of can't handle all that. Like you, you're doing well, you know, you got stuff online and other people like they can barely struggle doing like one or two things a day. Right. Is it just like personal drive that separates people like you or what do you think it is something you're born with or you learn? What do you think the reason for that is? You know, I don't know. That's a really good question. I think that, um, I think there's a, you know, this entrepreneurial spirit and the farmer spirit, I think are very um, similar. You know, there's a drive there to try and, do something to accomplish something to make something that wasn't before. Uh, I think you see that in entrepreneurs all the time. Um, and they're trying to do it with business. So I think that whatever that is within um, our persons that, you know, cause us to, you know, start businesses and try and build something that wasn't there before. It's the same thing on a ranch, you know, it's, it's very much trying to, you know, um, you know, manage or wrangle, if you will, uh, mother nature, uh, and build something that is, you know, that provides a, a product or, or a service to, you know, to the betterment of the community. So I think they have a very common, you know, psychic in, in both of those and, and they complement each other really. Um, you know, in IOT, really, one of the earliest adapters of IOT and the biggest adapters of IOT has been agriculture. Um, and the use cases around agriculture are, uh, are, are, are quite impressive in terms of the efficiencies they bring to farming and the, the, the quality of food product that it could produce. So things like um, fertigation systems where you, you, know, you're, you have sensors in the field that are you know, managing you know, how much moisture, but also how much nutrients that plant needs and can automatically you know, tell the, um, the pump or the nutrient system to put whatever they need into the, the sprinkling system. So while you're irrigating, you're not only giving it moisture for water, but you're also giving it the right amount of whatever it might need, nitrogen or uh, phosphorus or whatever it might need to, for the uh, health of the plant. And I agree, you know, uh, harvesting equipment and plant health, um, um, there's just a number of use cases. So they kind of merge definitely together. And I even use it in the cattle operation, I'm trying to make a, in the process of making a smart corral system so that, you know, cause right now the cow that goes to market is the slowest one, right? The one that's <laughs> easiest to catch, but uh, we're actually working on a system whereby, um, you know, cause the cows all have RFID tags. So as they walk through, you can, you know, know which cow it is and then gates can open and close and kind of manage and move that cow you know, through the facility so that if it needs to be separated or if it needs to go to market, whatever it is, it can, it's less stress on the animal. It's safer for the, you know, the handler. And so there's a lot of crossover between IOT and, and agriculture. Is there a way for tech to tell if a cow is like more healthy than another cow to eat or something like that? Like do something like that? Oh yeah, they actually have, uh, I've never actually used them, but there are actual um, ingestible sensors for cattle. Um, and you you can, the, it, the cow ingests it and it attaches to a cow has three stomachs and I think it attaches to the middle one if I'm not mistaken uh, but it then it can actually uh, chirp out temperature so that if you know if the animal's in heat and uh, you know different certain biological um, other uh, chemical makeups that it chirps out that gives you the health of the cattle um, so you can do that I mean it's very expensive still and still not cost effective but, um, and most of these guys, most ranchers who have been around cows for, um, and they can look at a cow and they'll tell you what's wrong with it. I mean, it's, they don't need, they don't need something that to, to do it, but in large herds and stuff like that, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for that. Rob, is there any difference between a cow or cattle being cow fed? I mean, a uh, green fed or, um, grass fed, does that really matter? Oh yeah, that's huge. Um, 
you actually have uh, that's a you know and most people you know i don't think they they understand the difference so but you're you're exactly right so a grass-fed animal um will actually have a different taste than a like a corn-fed animal uh, or a grain-fed animal um the grass-fed will be a little bit will be much leaner it will be a little more gamey you know where the corn fed will be more you know have a lot more marbling on it uh, and it's probably more what you're used to getting at steaks when in restaurants and that's kind of like our our model is kind of the best of both worlds because ours are strictly they're great they're grass fed and beer fed is what i always say <laughs> and so they they're on the grass so they don't they're not you know some of the corns and the starches that you put in those those feedlots can be you know, there's a lot of controversy around what that, whether that's good for us. And so we don't do any of that, but it's all, they get the grass and they get the grain. So we kind of have a, um, a perfect balance of both. So if a, a ranch is like uh, doing grain, grain feeding or corn feeding to the cattle, does that automatically mean that hormones are being added to the cow? No, not at all. There are, there are, anim- there are uh, ranches that, you know, specifically do that. And it's more the corporate ranches right because you know they're trying to gain weight much quicker you know operations of my size and regular family farms i think very rarely have i ever you know of all the ranchers and cattlemen that i know none of them actually do it but i know that you know corporate farms and um, do that quite a bit but if because they're feeding grain does not mean they're getting hormones at all okay and can you talk some about the, I think it's called farmer market where like you actually know where, where your like your meat is coming from. Like, you know, it's coming from your ranch mm-hmm. versus like yeah. you go to like a grocery store, you have no idea where it's coming from. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a lot of people are starting to, you know, see the value of that where, <clears throat> you know, you can trace, you know, we can trace the uh, lineage of the animals that, that we have, you know, for in some point, in some cases, generations, I have um i do have one cow that you know has been around she's kind of the family pet and she's been around for generation after generation um uh, but for the most part i mean we we definitely know you can know where every every animal live where they grazed where they you know where they were born um we keep pretty good track of that you know it's not something that you you know no one really ever asks in terms of it but um you certainly can keep that and that's one of the advantages that the small farmers have is that you can know where your you can know where your 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 food has actually been and where it comes from. So, do you remember what age you were when you actually first started working on your, on your ranch? <laughs> when, you, when your dad said, "Hey, it's time to get out here and your keep, so to speak." Yeah, yeah. I think it was five. Five. <laughs> yeah, I think I um my uh, I I think my first recorded history. I was feeding cows at five, had a pitchfork and cowboy hat, and I was out in the winter and and feeding, and then it was been every day since you know um you know I, I moved away for a few years but then moved back um you know to kind of you know take it over from my dad and whatnot but it's been something that's it's it's you know and i think a lot of times it's not farming and ranching is not a profitable business by any means um and it's there's so many you know so many unknowns you're dealing with mother nature and you can never you know predict what's going to happen we're in the middle of a drought right now, which is causing all kinds of problems. Um, but it's almost like I always tell people, I don't know how not to farm. It's like, it's like I have to, it's like I have to do it, you know. Uh, if I didn't do it and I'm mad about it all the time and I get upset about it, but I guess, you know, my, my wife and kids say, well, why don't you just stop doing it? Well, I don't know. I don't know how not to farm, I guess. So, so your third generation, is it going to be a fourth generation? Your family's going to take the, uh, the ranch over? They're pro- yeah, there, I have I have six kids, um, you know, three three girls and and uh, two boys or sorry four girls and two boys, and um, one of them one of the uh, one of my oldest daughters she runs the operation right now. Um, the boys are still one just graduated college, one's in college now, but um, they're they they're interested in the you know keeping the place going and and whatnot. So, so one of them will take it over, I'm sure. So Rob, next, uh, can you talk some about the Ben Oregon craft beer um, culture? Because it's pretty well known, I think. Yeah, it's, you know, it it really started in the, I want to say it was 92, 93. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Gary Fish started brewing in what is probably the most popular microbrewery that we have here is Deschutes Brewery. Um, and they distribute, you know, pretty much nationwide. 
Um, and they really started kind of that craft brewing uh, industry here in our town. And from there, uh, it really, the beer culture has, has really spread. So, um, you know, some of the other big ones we have, uh, Sun River Brewing Company, Boneyard Brewing Company, Ben Brewing Company, uh, McMinimum, Silver Moon. Um, th those are the ones I can remember. I want to say there's something like 30 or 40 different microbrews around. Um, and, and a lot of them, the ones I mentioned, doing, you know, some really good national distribution. Um, and, but most of them are still just local. And, and what happens when you get that, you know, when you first get that one that one uh, brewer in to take hold, you start, you know, getting, you know, guys who understand the beer making process. And so you have some talent, you have some skill in the area and it just kind of, you know, starts to multiply in terms of other, other businesses popping up. And it's become, it has become a bit of a, you know, an attraction here in Bend. Bend is, is a, is a, is a tourist um, destination, you know, kind of for the West coast. Anyway, uh, we have a ski resort here and, and in the summer, it's a lot of hiking and biking and um, whitewater rafting, golfing is big. Um, so we are kind of a destination and the beer culture has really added to that. And I think has really taken this town that was, um, you know, um, could have died in the day of the, the, the sawmill because when the sawmills died, um, that was the, this town was a, a mill town and then it kind of reinvented itself. So for, so for us, the microbrewery culture has been quite a godsend. And about how many people live in Bend, Oregon? The city limits is about 100,000 now. Um, I remember when I was a kid, the sign said 10,000. So it's, um, it's definitely doubled or, or grown in size. Uh, in the entire county, I think it's about 150 or 200,000. So it's not huge. You know, it's not, it's, it is kind of the largest city um, east of the mountains. But, um, you know, the metropolitan areas of Oregon are really Portland, yeah, Eugene and Salem. And so we kind of, a, we're considered a small town. And you, you were born and raised there? Born and raised in the house I'm talking to you from. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So back to the cataracts real fast. So I have a cousin, her and her husband just bought a ranch in Texas, like 300 acres, right? There was a pre existing ranch, they bought it. So they're doing the cattle thing now. What advice you'd have for them? <laughs> Sell now. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had a buddy, a friend of mine, when I started, when I came back and I said, uh, I said, uh, I, I was trying to figure out how to, where I was going to take the ranch kind of the next generation. Cause it was, you know, my dad was going on and I asked, uh, and it, he was a buddy of the fa family friend for years and he came back and I call, invited him out to lunch. And I says, you know, I want to just kind of pick your brain. I says, how am I going to, how can I make this place make money? He says, if you'd like to make a small fortune on a ranch, you got to start with a large one. And that's probably about it. <laughs> you know, I don't know that it's, it's, it's not a money-making proposition. It's definitely the people that do it, do it um, for the love of it. Um, and I guess, you know, if I was getting, and I've got a couple kids that um, I lease some land to, they wanted to start a gardening business and they wanted to, and I says, all right, well, you can, I gave them a little plot of land and let them start, you know, and, it's, it's a bit, um, it's a, it's a dream. I think a lot of times people that say, we want to live on a ranch. I want to be part of that. Um, but it's gotta be something that you, you love. It's gotta be in there. Um, you can't do it for the money. Can't do it for the glory. <laughs> There's none of that in it, but I tell you, there are, there are those days of, um, real satisfaction. And there are those days when, you know, uh, always when I talked about golf, there's always that one golf shot that just keeps you coming back. You know, yes, <laughs> you just I, get I, that I, one drive. Yes. I know that feeling. <laughs> yeah. well. You think the whole, the whole day you're out there, you're thinking, I'm not going to be out here anymore. And then you get that one drive and you go, oh, I'll come back again. But it's, you know, even this morning, it's the, uh, it's those sunrises, you know, in the morning when, you know, when you got a few minutes of peace and quiet and everybody's calm, it's, it's seeing, um, it's seeing the satisfaction of a bringing in a harvest. Um, you know, there are those moments of satisfaction. And, and I think that's kind of the, I call the crack cocaine or ranch and is the, <laughs> you know, it's those natural moments when that you get that uh, a lot of people just don't get to experience, you know, if you live in a city and you don't live on a ranch and um, I, 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 any advice I'd give to somebody who's going to be a rancher is and enjoy those moments. Cause um, that's a lot of the reward. 
So Bend, Oregon is is a tourist place, a craft beer. But correct me if I'm wrong, but it's also a pretty well known uh, BC investment startup community too. Correct. It is. Yeah, you've done your research. Yes. Um, um, it has a, quite a bit. In fact, um, there is. Uh, you know, I say we're kind of a West Coast um, destination town. Um, especially for, you know, people coming from Seattle or up from San Francisco. So we're kind of like halfway between San Francisco and Seattle. Uh, and those are two really good tech areas to be um, in the middle of. So a lot of um, startups, a lot of people who, um, you know, did well in their startups uh, will have a house in Bend and they may commute just like me. I mean, I'm a commuter from here to San, from Ben to San Francisco. And I've met all kinds of people on the plane, you know, and it's amazing the number of people that live in Bend and work someplace else. I met um, one time I sat next to uh, Tom Cruise's stunt double. He was living, he lives in Bend and, um, and he was commuting to LA and, you know, Tom Cruise is like five foot two, I think. And this guy was like six, six. Um, uh, a lot of uh, sat next to, um, the uh, a couple guys who work at Apple, the industrial designers who designed the the MacBook, they were they lived in Bend. Probably the best story. Um, I was on the plane one day, getting ready to go, and I, this older gentleman sat next to me. And um, he, I looked, you know, we were across the aisle, and I looked. He had this huge ring, like I knew it was a Super Bowl ring, or a World Series ring, or something like that. And I says, uh, and I, you know, I, you know, commuters, airplane commuters, we try not to, you know, keep your head down, you know, don't talk to anybody. Um, but I did mention to the guy, I go, I go, um, I go, excuse me, sir. I go, is that a, a Super Bowl ring? And he was very humble and very shy. He goes, no, he goes, no, it's not. He goes, and I kind of waited. <laughs> he goes, it's a World Series ring. And he was an older gentleman. And I says, oh, I go, were you a player? He goes, no, he goes, it was from the White Sox and I, I'm one of the owners. <laughs> he goes, I got the best job in the world. You know, I go, I go, that is a good job. But he lives in Bend. So he, he lives in Bend and he commutes to to Chicago. So a lot of that and because of that, you know, I think uh, destination, it has start, become a um, a hotbed for VC. So there's probably the lead um, firm in town is Seven Peaks Ventures. They bring in a lot of um, a lot of these guys who are trying to build funds. They've got a big fund themselves. Um, and a lot of these guys are living here. So they like to have their investment portfolios managed in a place where they for their living as opposed to maybe in the valley or in Seattle. So, yeah, you're right. There is a, a big, big uh, influx of money around. So it's safe to presume there's a direct flight from Bend at the Bay Area. Oh, yes. Yes, there is. You can go and. Ben goes direct to the Bay Area, uh, let's see, San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, Denver, Seattle, Portland, uh, Phoenix, and Utah. Don't ask me how I know all the flights that <laughs> <laughs> come out of Ben. <laughs> and how, how often do you fly to the Bay Area? How, how do you manage that? Um, well, now during the, since the pandemic, um, it's only been about once a month. Um, I was, you know, before I was on the road, Monday through Thursday, you know, three weeks three weeks out of every four. And so I'd make, I'd stay, stay back one. Um, but now it's about one week, one week a month. So it's not so bad. And, you know, with everybody going virtual, it's, it's, um, you know, we've been doing that for years and years, but uh, now it's, now it seems more acceptable than it was before. So change the subjects, you know, recently a, a lot of big tech companies have been in the news, like, you know, probably not the most positive things. Mm -hmm. Do you think we need to hold big tech accountable or that's something that, they should just do it themselves. Government needs to steps in, or that's something like no, that's like no big deal. Well, there's two. You know, I think it's a it's a great question. That is a great topic. You know, I, I would love to. I could talk about that all day. Um, you know, it's in to draw an analogy of of, of farming as well. Um, there's a drought going on right now in, in Central Oregon, and um, uh, there's a there's a shortage of water. They turn the water off to the farmers, and so a lot of crops dried up um, and but some of them didn't because um, they because of the way water rights work. Some people had water and other people didn't. It wasn't that there wasn't enough water. It was that, you know, the way that the law is written, um, some people got it and some people didn't. Uh, but they were the people that did receive the water. They 
they did they kind of took it for granted they didn't self-regulate they didn't put in they don't have you know piping in place they don't have the efficiencies that you need that comes as a responsibility if you are a consumer a farmer of water i think it's your responsibility to make sure you are using these natural resources in a responsible way you know not just kind of you know flood irrigating like they used to do back in the day because they had to um, but that's an inefficient use of our resources and it takes away not only from you know the the efficiency of the farm but the health of the river and the use of other farmers so there is a responsibility of farmers to self-regulate and to do to you know manage and be good stewards of the things that they have been given i feel the same way about technology you know we have in in technology been given you know and you can call it a gift um and and I, it's maybe it's whatever whatever terminology you want to do but it's this understanding of how to manage and manipulate you know bits and bytes and how to put together um you know these electronic platforms so that they actually produce something like facebook or like google or like thing logics right we we put together bits and bytes and we create something out of it. well i do believe there's there is um the requirement to self-regulate there but the almighty dollar does not you know is, is a little bit more of a motivator than than i think sometimes self-regulation um given you know the political climate of today and we see what's happening with big tech uh i do i do think um they've gotten too much too much influence in in our day-to-day -day lives um i think there is the um the responsibility and i there's a I think it was one of the ladies that the whistleblower that came out on Facebook recently. Um, you know, we regulate the tobacco industry. We tell you can't you can't advertise to kids. We regulate the liquor industry. We say we can't. You know, we got to protect these. We regulate, you know, um, you know, arts and images, and we regulate we regulate water. We regulate you know who can drive. We don't let anybody just have a driver's license. Um, so I do think if you know if big tech decides that um, you know they can um, you know push the envelope a little bit, I do think it's our responsibility um, to say, all right, we need to we need to put this in check. Um, now that being said, it's a little bit like the you know the drug culture. Right? You know, who do you regulate? Do you, do you do you get rid of the guy who's supplying the drugs? Or do you get rid of the guy who's taking the drugs? Who do you regulate on that? And it's, you, it can't, you know, and a lot of times, again, in farming, if, if there's a problem um, in the way things, are, your food is being grown, they go directly to farmers and say, you got to take care of it. Well, sometimes it's the processor. Sometimes it's the consumer who's got to take care of this. And I think in big tech, it's the same thing. You know, um, you got somebody who's supplying the drugs and you got somebody who's doing it. So we got to work both sides of that equation. There's got to be some education in terms of, you know, just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should. Just because, you know, in Oregon, you know, uh, we legalized cannabis. We have legalized CBD. We also just um, legalized uh, wild mushrooms and certain other drugs in our last election. Um, so we have a very much an open or is getting more and more open. Um, so in that, because it's legal, does that mean that you now should do that? No, it does not necessarily mean you should do that. Um, and so it is that supply and demand that we got to uh, address both sides of the equation. And I think regulations should go on both sides of those, not just on one side. And I think that would, is what will help solve that problem. So something totally random. I had no idea what Rod Muffin for until like a year ago, right? I had no clue what that was. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> well, they apparently they are very um, useful in in treating some, you know, mental disorders, I think, like schizophrenia and paranoia. Um, I'm not exactly I'm not a not a doctor, nor do I play one. That's the one thing I don't do. I farm and I do technology, but no, no medical here. Right. But uh, as I understand it, they do have some medicinal purposes that um, that people would greatly benefit from. Well, holding tech companies account, one thing I think would be a challenge is like, how do you, I mean, I don't think you hold them all, all accountable the same way, right? Because can you hold Facebook and Twitter, Amazon, and Microsoft account the same way? I, I don't think you can, right? Because I want to do now, different things. You know, it's going to be, it can't really, it's not going to be a one size fits all, right? You can't, um, because those are like 
it's 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 a little bit like you know um and i can't even think of a good there there's there are apples and oranges you know what facebook does uh amazon doesn't do at all right <laughs> amazon doesn't really have a social media i guess they they bought a couple they have um um, and they have they have their own Twitch or something. Twitch, yeah, yeah, yeah. Trying to think the name of it. Um, they bought that, but for the most part, Amazon provides technology services, especially on the AWS, these microservices, which ThingLogix built on top of. And that was really our, and we, you know, ultimately we originally sold one of those microservices to Amazon, but that's a very different technology than it is than what Facebook does and what Google does now. You know, uh, Facebook has its own data centers because it got so big. Google has its own data centers. Amazon has its own data centers. Um, they all are becoming the giants in their industry, but um, we still have giants in other industries too. You know, um, we still have oil giants. We still have corporate farming giants. We still have banking giants. We still, have, you know, there are giants in all these other ones. And it, it would be like saying, okay, well, we're going to apply the same rules that we applied to, you know, the financial institutions to you know facebook well that doesn't make any sense one's finance and one's technology so i do i don't think it can be a, a one-size-fits-all thing yeah one thing about like facebook and instagram being downloaded day i don't think people realize how much small business a business in general rely on facebook and instagram for the business right like it was pretty clear the other day well and it became you know facebook has become the advertising medium right I mean, it used to be, I actually started out in marketing and my bachelor's is in marketing. And it used to be that, um, you know, you would do your radio ads and print ads and TV ads. And that's how you could, you know, get through, get your message out. Um, well, those don't really have the same effectiveness anymore. And if you really want to get your message out, you have to go where the people are. And the people are on Facebook. So people complain about those ads and, um, and I'm not, I mean, yes, it does get a little weird in terms of you go do a search on just, Google. Just, and all just a little sudden, bit, just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> all of a sudden it starts showing up on there. Um, but I think also to, to, you know, I mean, I, to, to some degree that helps in terms of, if I know like most of my Facebook feed comes up, it's all farm ads. Right. <laughs> and every time I get a new one, like I, I, the one that came up the other day and I thought it was, it was, I have a, you know, flies are a big problem on a ranch, right? Flies. Cause you have cows and whatnot. And there a little ad came up for like $12. I could get this fly catcher and I put the fly catcher out. It is amazing. It's from a little tiny, you know, home startup, you know, in Nebraska someplace. And it just worked great. And so to some degree, and everybody always talks about the advertising because there is that bad side of advertising. There's that intrusive side. I don't want you to intrude on me. But as a customer, as someone who is a, a farmer, I would be interested and would like to know about other small farms that have stuff that I could help participate in. So there again, there is a balance of, again, I don't think we can just say cut off all advertising. I mean, Stop getting a little too freaky. Like, you know, when I call somebody, don't now put their, their recommendation up on my, my feed, you know, so there is a balance there. There's a usefulness there. And back to cattle real fast. Um, I know a lot of climate people will say that cows like give out through methane gas and that kind of stuff. Is that true, accurate is something they're making up? <laughs> well, uh, scientifically, it is absolutely true. They do give off methane. Um, but what is exaggerated is the amount of methane they give off. Um, you know, to uh, and there's actually an initiative here in Oregon and um, prop. Uh, I mean, I think it's called PR13, uh, where they're trying to ban the um, ability to kill an animal, to kill any animal, whether it's a the only way an animal can die is through natural causes. So that would that would eliminate all you know meat products and pig pork products and chicken products and um, deer hunting elk any of those you would it would ban that ability now one of the one of their arguments is that by doing so you know we're going to you know we're going to help the methane gas problem well it's not true because if you left it, those animals if you left bovine un, unregulated they would multiply, there would be cows on every golf course, there would be cows on everybody's lawn, 
because as soon as the as soon as a farmer doesn't regulate and manage the cows anymore and he can't make any money off you know the the product then he's going to let open the gates and let the cows go and the cows are going to go where the green grass are and so there's going to be cows and something everywhere and then you, um, you have to kill all the clouds and slaughter the cows and deal with that exactly you you would in and part of me is like you know that would be the greatest law ever because what would happen then is they would people would call up someone like me that says all right we have a cow in our yard can you come get it you bet and i'll make more money picking up the cow out of their yard <laughs> and keeping it away from them than i will ever off the off the slaughter of that animal um so i do i do think it's over exaggerated um in, in terms of the amount do they give off methane yes absolutely um, but to target that as our biggest producer of, of method of climate change, I mean, I would, I would also point to uh, I, when humans weren't around and did, I mean, were the dinosaurs giving off methane? I bet you there was some pretty big methane clouds going up with those around. So I, I, I'm not going to pretend to know the science on that. Um, but I also don't think that it's a, um, and obviously I'm, a bias source on that, but do I think it's the solution to our climate problems? No. Um, of any, in terms of climate and weather, I am probably as acutely aware of that because my livelihood depends on that, you know, what, what weather patterns are. Like this is an El Nino year and hopefully we'll, the drought will come out. And how much water is in aquifers, how the river flows are. I, I mean, all that stuff I look at on a weekly basis to see, you know, where water's going, how it's moving um so that we can so we can plan and um you i've i've done it for years and you see the cycles it's every seven to ten years we'll see it we'll go we'll come out of it again um if we don't then maybe i'm wrong maybe it's not secular maybe this is the end but i don't i don't think so so Rob, i think most people have heard of the vegan diet or vegetarian diets but one thing that's getting popular now i just found out about is something called a carnivore diet but people only eat meat. Have you heard yeah. about that? Or what's your thoughts on that? Think it's a healthy thing to do or what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, and I don't, I, I don't know. I think there's a, um, there, and I'm trying to remember the name of it, but there was a diet and somebody had called uh, and was ordering beef from me and told me that they were on that and, you know, how, um, how great it was and how, you know, how much uh, more energy they had. And I think there's, uh, was it the Adkins diet was very protein based uh, diet. So um, I, you know, I try to balance those out. I you know, obviously being a cattle rancher, I eat probably more meat than, than most people do, you know, but I eat vegetables too. So I do chicken and fish as well. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but I do think it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, and to me, health has always been about consistency. You know, if, if you have never eaten meat and you start eating meat, you're going to feel horrible. Or if you don't eat a lot of meat and you do eat a lot of meat one day, you're going to feel bad. If you eat a lot of meat and you stop eating it and you eat veg vegetables, you're going to feel horrible. You know, you're, I think it's, a, you know, it's not unlike, you know, na nature itself. It's consistency and steady as she goes. And I think the more we treat our bodies and I mean, if you consistently treat it bad, it will get really, really bad. But moderation in all things, I think is, is really the key. So Rob, as a CTO of ThinkLogix, can you talk about the process of deciding to go with AWS versus another cloud platform? Well, that was actually kind of, um, we were kind of thrown into that one. So um, my, the founder, my, myself, uh, myself and my two partners were also part of another company called uh, Telemetry, Telemetry, number two, Telemetry. It was a startup. Uh, we had, there was a group of us that um, were doing cloud computing doing Salesforce consulting, those kinds of things back in the uh, early 2000s. And, and we, you know, saw this idea of machine to mean machine communication. We thought, well, this would be cool. So we started a, tar a startup inside of in Denver. And uh, our goal was to um, build a piece of technology that would be able to consume, you know, masses of amounts of data on a regular basis. Because at that point, you know, specifically data was about, you know, I send a request, I get a response. I send a request, I get a response. Um, and I get data out of, I get data from a, a website that gets data from a database that, you know, I somehow manipulate or change or insert or update and I send a request back and that, that works. And so all of our infrastructure was designed about how many, you know, 
How many hits can your website take? How much, how many people can you put on this one server to, you know, before you need to get another server? Um, well, when with machine to machine communication that that flipped it on its head because it's no longer, you know, request and response. I send a request to get a response. A machine to machine is I'm a temperature sensor and I'm sending data constantly. I'm constantly talking. I'm 76, it's 76, it's 76, it's 77, it's 78. So I constantly send data and that's more of a, it's a, a event-based architecture as opposed to give me, a, here's a request, here's a response. So our infrastructure wasn't designed to handle that and you had to have direct dedicated connections and all kinds of underlying stuff that had to happen for you to be able to consume millions and millions of uh, pieces of data. So at telemetry, we were trying to, build this. And because we all kind of came from the Salesforce ecosystem, our goal was uh, essentially tried to sell this to Salesforce. And because we knew that IoT, actually the, the terminology hadn't been bent, we called it machine to machine back then. And, and um, so our goal was to, to sell it to Salesforce. Well, we had a client who wanted us to prove out to it because it was a very new technology. And they said, all right, we want you to prove to us that you can handle 1 million simultaneous connections over a period of I don't know, like a week or something. And by simultaneous connection, millions of simultaneous connections, that's a million simultaneous connections every millisecond. Like if I have a million people every millisecond hitting my service, will the service perform? So we had to create a test for this. Well, how do you do that? I mean, we don't have a million, at that time, there wasn't a million sensors available to us out there. How do you create an environment where you can do this huge, you know? So we had to spin up a bunch of um, EC2 instances on Amazon. And so we spun up all these EC2 instances to handle our, to which our product was built on. And then we spun up a bunch more EC2 instances to, um, uh, to hit the stuff that we just, we just spun up. And we literally got a call from Amazon that said, stop that. <laughs> what are you doing? Um, what, are you, what are you guys doing over there? Well, um, then it went very quickly. We, we explained uh, what our product was and, um, we ended up selling it to Amazon. And so what is today the microservice called AWS IoT Core was the technology that, that we pioneered at, at telemetry. So um, after the acquisition, there was uh, my, my other two partners and I um, didn't want to move to Seattle, didn't want to go to, because most of the people from the company were acquired into Seattle, but there's no place to put cows in Seattle. So <laughs> I, was, I couldn't go up there. And so we decided, um, and Amazon didn't really want the customer base that we had built up. So we took the customer base and started providing professional services around the technology that we just sold to Amazon. Um, but over time, we realized that it wasn't just what we had built was just one piece of that. We'd built the IoT core. And what we really needed was a whole solution of how to do IoT. Like, how do you, I mean, you don't just need to send data to um, a service, you need user management, you need device management, you need context, you know, into where the services are going, you need to be able to put security around it, you need an API to get data in and out, you need all these things to really make a solution. So what we started building was these repeatable patterns um, on how to do an IoT professional services engagement. Well, after several years, we realized it's not just a pattern, it's a product. It, it could be both, but my, my partner, the CEO called it a, pod, pro, a product, I called it a pattern. But at the end of the day, what really ends up with is a way for you to you know, configure your way to an IoT solution, um, as opposed to having to get under the covers. And ironically, or maybe not so much, it's very much the way what Salesforce did to the CRM world. You know, I'm sure Benioff and, and Parker Harris were sitting around one day going, you know what, I know everybody out there is building databases and they're calling it account and contact and lead and opportunity. And they're putting first name, last name, email address and phone number. And why don't we just give them all that? Why don't we just give them all that building blocks and then let them, you know, um, uh, customize the last 20% to the uniqueness of their building, of their business. And that's what Salesforce really became. It became here, here's a, here's a CRM. Now configure your way to your unique business needs. Well, um, that's what um, ThingLogic's Foundry actually became. Here's an IoT solution that can handle billions and billions of pieces of transactional data um, built entirely on serverless resources around of AWS. Now configure your way to meet your particular need, your particular business need. 
And what's more, let's also connect into Azure. Let's connect into Google. Let's make a cloud of clouds, you know, a truly something that sits out on top of all those. So that's how we actually ended up um, becoming on, on Amazon uh, was, uh, you know, our, our baby <laughs> grew up and was, was acquired by uh, Amazon. So we kind of stuck with it and started building, uh, building stuff around it. And so something off random, um, the Salesforce building is actually the tallest building in San Francisco, right? Yes, I believe it is the new one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you give us a simple definition of IOT? A simple definition of IOT, and it means a lot to other, uh, it means very different things to a lot of people. It's become a very broad term. But to me, IOT is two things talking to each other, two things sending a message back and forth. Now, that could be a temperature sensor and a thermostat. It could be a water sensor and a pump. It could be a person and a, you know, temperature sensor. It could be a business and another business, but it's sending messages. And um, you can actually, and I, the, probably the simplest way to think about IoT is you know, imagine your, your house or your refrigerator or your thermostat being able to send you a text message. And it can send a text message. And, but you don't obviously want to listen to all those text messages. You want to be able to say, look, if, if the temperature sends me a, a, a message that says, hey, it's 100 degrees in here, then I want you to send another message to the you know, air conditioning unit to turn on or something. You know, it's the ability to manage and put intelligence, thing logics, put logics around that thing. Um, actually, one of the products we just came out with um, was it's called Chirply, where we actually took SMS messaging and added intelligence around SMS messaging. So as an example, you send it, you're a Spanish speaking person and, and I'm an English speaking person. So I send my texts in English. You receive them in Spanish. You type them in Spanish. I receive them in English or Arabic or whatever your language is. We're able to put intelligence around the messaging. You send us a picture of your of a form and we can extract, do the text extract and fill out a form for you and put that in a database. We can, you know, you can send a picture of, you know, of, of an image of something and we can recognize it and take an action on it. So it's still just the ability to manage messages and the connection. Um, a friend of mine said we shouldn't call it the Internet of Things. We should call it the Internet of Everything, where everything is talking. And now we need the ability to put logic around what they're saying. So Rob, as a CTO, well, what's your point of view of what a CTO should be doing? And should that change based on the size of the company or other factors? Well, that's a really great question because um, when, yes, it, the, it changes uh, on the size of the, of the company because essentially I think CTO for me in the, in, in the early days was just a, was, well, there was me and my partner and, he was CEO, and I guess I, I'm the programmer in the bunch, and so I had to write the code that made me CTO, I guess. Um, but as that company grows, I think it's you know the CTO or, or CIO's responsibility is 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 a couple of things. One, it's it's you know, and I go back to that farming background. I think we are stewards of what we have been given. I, as a as a farmer, I am a steward of the land and a steward of the resources that I've been given. I think as a CTO. I need to be a steward of the technology to make sure I'm using it in a responsible way. Um, IoT is one of those things that you could go off the rails really quickly, right? I mean, we've invented Big Brother um, with no question about it. I mean, we have the ability to do that. Now, you it takes some responsibility to make sure that you're using useful, useful applications of it because um, just the, some of the medical technologies that we've gotten since IoT has come around especially the pandemic with telemedication, telemedicine, it's been amazing. And none of that would have been possible really without some of these, these stepping stones in terms of, of, um, of how technology has evolved. But yeah, it can go off the rails pretty quickly. So I think um, as a CTO, it is our responsibility to provide some oversight into how we are responsible using our technology. Um, and to be outside of the financial, right? Um, I think we need to look at the, you know, and I think this is where some companies get in trouble is, you know, the finance, finance and technology are so intertwined 
that, okay, finance is okay. Well, let's just make more money. We need more money. And let's re regardless of how we do it. I think, Sue, uh, as technologists, it is our responsibility because we do know, we can see how what we are doing could go off the rails. And I think it's our responsibility to make sure um, we stay on the rails. Now, now, I'm also a religious man. And so I do believe that there, you know, we have a responsibility that's greater than, you know, just trying to make money. Not all my fellow CTOs share that and that's, that's okay. Um, but I also think direction and, and being able to look down the road and see where we're headed. Um, I always say, you know, I always said I could see five years out. I can look five years out and, and um, you know, I built, I built e-commerce platforms in 1993. Well, they became popular in 1998. Um, <laughs> I built, a, I, I built a, a messaging system, basically a, a Facebook idea back in the 99. And it was so embarrassed. I thought this is people were using it and it was growing and growing and they were posting stuff on this message. And I was so embarrassed about it. I, I shut it down. Well, Facebook came around after that. You know, I built the uh, how to build your own websites back in you know, 2000. I built a travel application, OTAs, you know, um, and then 9-11 hit. <laughs> I've, you know, I've, all those things. And I remember thinking IoT was going to be one of those. Um, so I do think it's our responsibility to look down there and kind of see where we headed, what's the direction, what's the trend. But recently, what I've also realized is what's probably more important is we don't need to live out there. We need to know theirs, but we need to um, kind of live more where the real need is. And at ThingLogics, um, we've been, you know, we're in our eighth or ninth year now. And I always said, we built a solution to a problem that people didn't know they had. And so now we had to wait for them to have that problem. And it's just kind of getting caught up. And so now we're actually doing really well because people are starting to understand that we have messages that we have to manage. We have to do this. There are business models that we would like to embrace a subscription business model instead of a request response model. And we need, um, we need technology that can do that. The old technology, it just isn't there, but um, you have to wait for that to catch up sometimes. And I think it's uh, as a CTO, we have to keep our eye on the future, but really realize what's important right now. So Rob, this is like a broad question and, and I'll, it'll, the answer will change based on you no know, case by case basis. Well, suppose you have a tech, not tech founder out there. He's, you know, he's done some stuff. He has a following, his idea, you know, he has a little bit of traction, but he needs to bring on a developer, right? How do you, how would you advise those two to break the equity down? Right. Cause I know some, some will say, well, like, like it's, it's worth it for the development. You know, they need to get more, you know, more than that the idea. The not tech founder might say, well, I've been doing all this work on my own. I didn't see him do this for me. Like what's your advice on those two sides, like figuring something out? Well, I've been on both sides of that equation. Um, I've been on the side as the developer who's, you know, trying to come in and say, you know, um, you know, I want some equity and um, I, I have been burned on both sides of it. Uh, I think that, uh, I think retention and tribal knowledge is probably, um, is probably the most important thing. Uh, what we tried to do at ThingLogics, um, we didn't hire proven experienced uh, developers. We went to colleges. Uh, I wanted to find people that, um, you know, because we were, we were talking in creating serverless technology back then where it, no, one, no one had done it and no one had put these things together and stitched it. They'd use this microservice and they'd use that microservice. But for the most part, people, the only people, what, they, what people thought of at the cloud was either Salesforce or uh, an EC2 instance, you know, virtualization of, of computers in the um, uh, off-premises. So, and I think I needed more than that. I needed people to think in terms of, of uh, this way we're, we're headed. So we went to colleges and when we went to colleges, um, we, couldn't offer, um, we couldn't offer developers, you know, the money that they could get at Google or Facebook or, or those kinds of things. So we actually looked for developers um, who had that, that passion, uh, who wanted to be started something and, and bring it. And I think, um, you know, I can teach just about anybody to code. Uh, I, coding is not, if you have an aptitude for it, if you like it, if you enjoy it, then I can teach it to you. Um, I can teach it to you over a weekend and you can start getting better and better and better. And I mean, to get really good, it takes longer than a weekend for sure. But I can teach you to code. What I can't teach you are those intangibles. I can't, I can't, 
um, train your spirit to have what we were talking about earlier. I can't train that farmer spirit or that entrepreneurial spirit in you that says, I want to build something. I, I, I want to build something. I want to make something. And I want to, you know, I want to have my own and I want to, that's what I want to do. And those are the guys we were looking for, those people that wanted to build that. Because the people that said, all right, well, how much are you paying? Because I was top of my computer science class because Google's offering me, you know, 180. Uh, what can you give me? Well, I can't give you 180. And if you if 180 is the thing that's important to you, then you need to be at Google and Facebook and those. And, you know, you can shop yourself around for 185 next year and then 195 the next year. And if that's what's important to you. So we couldn't compete on that. And as a result, um, when you find that that entrepreneurial spirit, when you find that spirit of that fits within your culture, then we do, you know, make sure these guys are, you know, um, incentivized to see the company go. So we make sure they have uh, a piece of it um, via, via option pools. As we spin up new companies, um, we actually make these guys into founders. Um, so we are building, Chirpley was one company we, we spin up off of it. Um, Workwatch um, was another one that we use for um, pandemic, you know, temperature sensing, uh, you know, taking, you know, fever uh, kiosks that could take your, your, your temperature and those kinds of things. Um, and as we build things on top of our platform, these guys um, start to end up with a portfolio of, of other startups and, and they like that. And I always say there's, there's people who belong in startups and there are people who belong in corporate America and the two shall never meet. Um, I've been a part of a lot of startups and every time um, one of the great startups I was a part of was a company called Aperio. They were one of the first um, Salesforce um, consulting groups. I was employee 29, I think. Um, they eventually grew to several thousand. They were acquired by a company called Wipro. Uh, but when it got to about, you know, 500 people, it started to become not a startup and it became a corporate structure, which it has to do to grow. You have to do that. But the people who were in there in the beginning, that becomes an uncomfortable organization for them. They all left and went to startups. So, so the people who were at startups and then the people who take it to the next level, I think those are two different groups and, and developers are the same way. I think some developers, they want to be part of those things at startup. They want to roll the dice. And I tell these guys, I go, you guys got 10 or 15 failures in you. So don't worry about it. if this one doesn't get it. Well, you know, you've got, you got, you got several more swings. Do you have a preference for hiring developers from coding academies or a four-year college? Oh, <laughs> you're 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 hitting all the hot spots. I I would take a code academy guy over a four year college. Any particular yeah. reason? Well, a um, couple things. One, it shows me that that's their initiative. They had to go out. They had to do it. You know, they had to um, do um, seek it out themselves. Uh, it wasn't a um, it wasn't a out for the college experience. Now. That being said, I do think um, our colleges, um, I think they, they do give that experience when you first go to college. And the value of the four-year degree to me is that, that going away from home, that transitioning from being a child to being an adult. And I think that's an important process. And there's a lot of growth that happens in there. And that's what happens, I think, at a lot of colleges. Um, I think the, in, in some of the colleges, I also think the ability to um, problem solve, you know, learn to, you know, learn, you know, to take an art class or take a literature class, learn some, to talk about problems outside of what code is. Um, but when it comes to hard code core developers, Code Academy guys, I mean, they can, I mean, and I've hired several of them where they just said, I, I'm self-taught, this is how I learned, And I'm like, yep, and they have that passion and they can end up coding. Now they end up being developers for a longer period of time. I think the guys who come out of, of university that we have kind of move into more of a solution architecting role quicker. They try to, they try to get through the, the development years and just being a code guy and they want to get into solutioning and architecting and those kinds of roles where some of the people who are, you know, just hard code coders, they love coding and they code. And I, they, I, that their value over the time of the life of, of an employee is, is immense. 
From what you're seeing, how long does it take for a developer to become, to become quote unquote a good developer? One year, two years, or longer than that? You know, these kids um, today are super smart. Um, and I always say these, you know, the guys that we have, and one of them, my son is actually one of our, our developers as well. And they type code faster than I can type an email. Um, they just, they get it, they can move through that. Um, I think it takes, and with these guys, most of the developers that we did, I ran them through um, internship programs, summer internship program where they're still in college. By the end of the first summer, you know, they were writing Lambda functions. They were, you know, um, configuring AWS services. By the end of the second summer, they were solutioning on top of it. So it, it depends on how much time you're going to put into it. You know, we always say the, um, there's a book, the 10,000 hours. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. And I think if the more, the more you get closer to that, the more proficient um, you actually get. Um, so I, I think I've seen, I've seen people, I had, I had one kid, he came in, he was a philosophy major and he just wanted to, he just wanted to learn. And, and we didn't have a, a spot for him, but he came back like six months later and he, man, he could, he, he ended up getting a job, um, I, I think with one of the big tech firms and he just can code like crazy, you know? So it doesn't, I don't think it takes long. It's, it's whether you have the aptitude and the passion, once you get it, once you understand what's going on and you understand kind of the underlying thing of how to write code, where you put the code and how it executes, then whether it's Node or Java or, you know, or uh, C Sharp or whatever it is, if then is still if then. And, and it just depends on where you put the semicolon, you know? Um, so I think it, I think a person could become very proficient if they worked at it on a daily basis in three to six months. You know, one thing I, I've been noticing too, there's a lot of people like, like we'll take social science degrees from college, like, you know, um, philosophy, social studies, whatever case would be. A lot of them are not finding jobs. So I see like a lot of them are freaking going to coding academies and now becoming coders. Yeah. And I think that's great because I think those, when they do that, they actually bring a, a you know, a, a, um, a problem solving perspective to solutions that most coders won't. Most coders may actually, if you're just a hardcore computer science guy you look at problems in terms of if then else and uh, i think sometimes um what you need to be able to do is look at problems of what would happen if <laughs> what would happen if we could is it possible that we could can we you know and explore that where i think a lot of times coders just look like oh i could do it and i could do it like this well let's take a moment and let's look at the other um, alternatives as well. And I think sometimes uh, uh, if you have some of that training, it, it lends yourselves to that pause. So let's suppose someone's out there, they're a non-tech founder. They have an idea for a company, but they need a developer, right? Or they need to do some coding. Would your, would your advice be for them to learn to code themselves? Bring on a, a, co a, a co-founder who's tech, a tech guy or tech person or outsource or something else? That's a good question. I've never been in that situation because I've always been the coder. Um, but, and I can see advantages and disadvantages to all of them. I guess if I had to pick one of those, um, I would probably uh, bring on a, 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 a freelance, a, a contract coder. Because um, a couple things will happen there. You get to try them out. You get to, you get to see what they're, what they're, aptitude is and you can move them in and out i wouldn't if you go out and, and i have been in a situation where i've you know partnered up with somebody that wasn't i didn't think was the right it wasn't the right fit and we didn't find out till later and then it's hard to get out of that partnership and it could cause the death of the business it could cause the death of the product um if you're a founder i would i would contract it out you know um um was it work up was it called i always forget the name of it work um Upwork, 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 work, up, Upwork, yeah, a great, a great service to find people that, you know, can do small types of projects, and I would break it down into those kind of small projects and try and see if you can't find someone to do little pieces of it, you know, uh, because there's two things that can go wrong. If you get one person involved, and they know the code, then they're going to hold you hostage. You know, if, um, and for people who don't code, they think, well, we just needed to code and all code is the same. Well, code is not the same. Code is like writing a book. It, it, it is completely to the discretion of the author on how they're going to write this. 
Um, and if you take one person's code and you hand it to somebody else, even though it's in the same language, they may or may not understand it. And they may not understand how they did it, or why they did it. And inevitably, <laughs> anytime you take a piece of code and you hand it to somebody, the new coder always goes, the old coder did it wrong. And then he rewrites it and hands it to somebody else because, well, I don't know why they did it like this. The old guy did it wrong. It's because it's not that each one does it wrong. It's that each one does it with what he knows how to do. And you have asked them to do it and you have asked them to, you know, solve this problem. And they did with what they know how to do. And then when you get rid of that guy and you bring in somebody new, he may or may not know um, how to solve it. He may have solved it a completely different way. Maybe it's worse. Maybe it's better. But you don't know. So I would advise, you know, to architect it and own the pieces of it. So if you know that, all right, I have to have a mobile app and I have to have a website and I have to have a this, have one guy, you know, start with an API and say, all right, I need you to be my architect and your solutions and make sure you know where everything is and where the code is and where the repository is. And then maybe you have another guy who builds your APIs and maybe there's another guy that does a little piece of work. So if you can contract for those small pieces, you will never be beholden to any one of them. And it also keeps your product moving forward so that, you know, you can get kind of um, economies of scale. When, when should a startup bring on, I think it's called a product manager. When, what number higher should that be? That's a good question. Um, very, very soon. As soon as you can afford one would be. Um, typically, uh, I've always acted as the product manager in the beginning um, until, until the product becomes viable and we can have the ability to say, okay, this is actually going to work and we're going to get sales on it. Um, I would say right after, I would say that, you know, from 10 to 20 sales, as soon as you started selling this product and you have people out there that are using it, um, you're going to need a product manager. You're going to need somebody up there that's going to listen to what your customers are saying, can decide, you know, because everyone's going to say, hey, can it do this? Can it do this? Um, I need it to do that. And you're going to need somebody on board that's going to say, mm, that's not our direction. That's not what we are. And, you know, and I think there's a tendency for, especially for startups, for people to go, oh, our customer has asked for this. So you take all your resources and put it in there. And that customer says, eh, okay, I don't really want it. So now you've, you know, put all your resources and put a lot of expense into a, a feature that maybe no one's going to use. So that product manager is one that really becomes a gatekeeper of what can what can we put in? What's the high value, low cost that we can get in? And they really need to manage that backlog. So I, I'm going to presume your product roadmap is pretty complicated. Can you talk about the process of how you work your product roadmap and how you process all that? So we do it very much like I just, like I had, um, sorry about that. Uh, like I just outlined for a product manager. So we keep a backlog of uh, customer requests. Um, so because we are a product and professional services organization, uh, we do have, um, you know, professional services out there that are requesting a feature um, that is maybe not available. So we will prioritize those if we have a professional service engagement and that engagement requires um, would where a feature would benefit that engagement um, that gets prioritized pretty high. Uh, we look at um, security issues are also um, highly prioritized. So we do security reviews every month. Um, our customers do security reviews. If anything um, gets, you know, up there, that's always the number one thing. Any, any type of uh, vulnerability that we, um, that we might that detect or, or think might be there, that gets prioritized. Um, then it becomes, at this particular point, um, stabilization and what we call quality of life stuff. Um, gets prioritized uh, next. So um, bugs, fixes, um, you know, it would be nice if we could do this, especially pipeline deployments, those types of things. Uh, we'll, we'll put some in that backlog. And then it becomes feature requests. And feature requests are driven off of our own products. So like um, Chirply, for example, is as we, when we started to spin that out, which is an SMS-based messaging uh, management with artificial intelligence around it, uh, we would need certain things. So we would add features so that, you know, Chirply could, that product could um, become uh, feature rich. And then um, the, the last thing will be, you know, kind of the wish list. So we always keep a running, uh, we always keep a running tally of with, so when I'm out in the field, I'll always think, you know, 
you know, it'd be really cool is if <laughs> if I could take a photo of the plant and you know send it back and text it in and and it would it would then put a to do on for the ranch hand so that they could know that they had to come and get this plant and you know and you know those kinds of efficiencies and we'll, those wish lists come at the end and we'll run through those about once a month and see if we have time again. Unfortunately, with a small company, you you don't get that deep into into the backlog, um, you know, paying the bills and the first first two are always the, um, the ones that are paying the bills. So that's the ones you're hitting the most. Rob, who, who should own the product roadmap? Who should own the product roadmap? I think um, I, I would say it's the, uh, and well, I have always owned it for the most part in collaboration with the product manager. Um, I think it is a responsibility of the CTO to really manage those in terms of direction. I think uh, the CTO should be, you know, looking at those and, and like we did a pivot with Chirply to say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna pause on IoT features in exchange for AI text messaging because that direction looks like there is a lot of more current opportunity. So I think that, you know, the CTO should own the direction, but the product manager really, just like the agile process itself, product manager really has to break that direction down into, you know, backlog, um, prioritization, resource management, and those kinds of things. So I think it's a combination of product manager and CTO. Can you talk about how you manage the C quote unquote manage the CEO, CEO as a CTO? <laughs> uh, well, in our particular case, we've known each other for years and years and worked. We've This is our third company that we've, uh, second one we've started together, third one we've worked at together. Uh, so we have a very collaborative, um, a very collaborative relationship. Uh, it, it, I've never had a problem with the CEO. It's, I think where the clashes happen is more with the CFO and the CTO, right? So um, the CFO is really dictating you know, a financial direction and, you know, uh, and the CEO is often looking at what, what looks good to investors versus what looks good to um, consumers, because you got to manage both of those. The CEO has got to manage the consumer side and he's got to manage the investment side. Um, you know, we, you know, I've started several bootstrapped companies where I've tried to bootstrap it, but we just, anymore, you need a, you know, we've had great angel investors um, to help us through, um, uh, but you have to manage, he has to manage those. And sometimes those are in conflict, you know, because what the investors want to see versus what the customers want to see versus kind of why you did this in the first place is, you know, you had this vision and you want to create it, this thing. Um, it's a combination. Now, I've been very, very fortunate and I've never had a, a CEO where we've clashed uh, even, you know, uh, Carl and I get on great um, at telemetry. It was Kyle, uh, Chris Barbin over at Perio. They were all really great CEOs. And um, I never had that situation where we clashed because it was always very collaborative. I, th I think if I did, I probably wouldn't be in the company. Can you talk about some positive and negatives in tech during the last 30 years that you've seen? Positive and negative. Well, I think those, those are two sides of the same coin in that, you know, every... Um, I, 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 and you, to go back to kind of, you know, the recent news around, you know, Facebook and, you know, is it, is tech the evil, is tech becoming the, you know, the, uh, evil giant and that's out there, or is it actually doing good? And I think, you know, the answer is both, um, for every, for every great technology that comes along that tries to exploit something to make money, there's some underlying value in all of that. Um, the great ones in the, the, the worst, I think the greatest thing that had happened in the last few years, last 30 years, I think you said, is cloud computing. That really was the, you know, when we started, when I started this, we, you know, the first website I had, I took an old Mac, I plugged it in, I had to do the, my own DNS routing, I had to put, configure the routers, I had to bring in the T1 line. I had to figure out, you know, how the network worked and how routing tables worked and uh, all of that stuff. And, 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 you know, every time that server went down, I got a message and, um, you know, that the utilitizing of, 
of compute power, I think has been the biggest, um, you know, the biggest change for, for the better. That also in, increased our compute power. So uh, essentially basically taking, get rid of the server closet, moving everything up, even if it's virtualization of servers like EC2s and, you know, like VMware and those kinds of things also been a huge, um, a huge component of that uh, cloud application. So uh, moving into cloud, I think has been by far the, the biggest advantage because it also started and gave us the ability to do businesses that couldn't exist before. Netflix, you know, you know, they were a DVD, they mailed DVDs back and forth. What Netflix is today wouldn't have been possible without Amazon and, you know, the compute power that they could, they could spin up. Um, you know, and there's, you know, lots of those, you know, Dropbox, all these things all kind of sit on top of um, these other compute, uh, cloud computing services and being able to create those businesses um, just would have been, would have been logistically impossible to spin up data centers and, and do that. Uber is another great one. You know, all these things are built on top of these cloud computing um, uh, companies. So that's probably the best one. Um, and the worst thing that's happened in 20 years, um, I'd say the worst thing that's happened in 20 years is that um, people have been giving have been giving away themselves to technology. It kind of goes back to, you know, where do we put the blame? I think it's easy to always say, is it, is it the drug dealer or the drug user that we have to blame in this situation? Um, um, it's easy to blame the drug dealer, but I do think we have to put some uh, responsibility and ownership on the users of this where, you know, just giving out your personal information, you know, people always say, well, we're, we're worried about, you know, the government finding about this and we're worried about, we're paranoid about people finding, well, stop giving your information. Stop telling people you're away from your house when you're on vacation, you know, stop, stop telling people you're going to the store. Stop giving, not, stop putting your dog's name and your, your city and your zip code and to stop taking these quizzes that give away, you know, all the information that you need to guess your password you know, just stop. <laughs> and I think if, if that's been the worst thing is it's people didn't, they don't understand what they're doing. They think it's, it's just a, they think it's harmless. Oh, as far as they're concerned, it's just a web page that only they can look at. Um, and they don't know that all that information is, is started. So um, I think that's probably the worst thing is that people just don't understand what they're doing with the technology. And, you know, if, if you keep asking for more drugs, the drug dealer, even though the drug dealer himself, maybe not take the drugs himself because he knows it's not good. He's going to keep giving it to you, you know? So I, I think that's it. Lack of education and understanding how, you know, to use the technology. Rob, do you have a preferred tech stack? Um, well, I, I'm an old Java guy. Um, so, you know, I did, you know, I did Java, Tomcat, Apache, you know, for years and years, whenever, and I still have a couple applications. I have a travel application uh, that I wrote, and I can say back in 2000, that books hotel rooms and does online travel agencies. And that still runs on the, you know, the, the Tomcat Java Apache um, stack. Uh, but that's probably the only legacy application I have left. To me, still, it, if you're not doing it, and obviously I'm going to be another bias source in this, but if you're not building your stuff in the cloud and on these services, resources, um, it, it, the cost of maintenance is higher, the reliability is lower, um, all that. So my tech stack today is really, you know, cloud services. Rob, is there a new tech out there that's coming that that, that excites you? Excites you? Uh, holograms. 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 I think we have. Um, we have started, you know, virtual reality has been, has been amazing. Um, and uh, I think we're going to start seeing, you know, I remember, I remember uh, probably 20 years ago, sitting around talking about, well, you remember, wouldn't it be cool how we're going to be able to, you know, it was still science fiction that we could have a video conference and we could, you know, we wouldn't be talking on the phone. You know, there's actually a phone hanging on the wall right here. Um, we, we would have this. It was just, and that we would talk to people around the world. It was fantasy back then. Um, I, I even remember my very first tech job, um, I worked for a company called Harbor Freight Tools, I built their catalog. I was building their catalog for them. And I remember the first gig drive 
first gig hard drive I got. We were sitting around looking at this great big box and then and we all joked about, you know, one day we're going to have a gigabyte of RAM. Oh my God, you never have a gigabyte of RAM, you know? Um, so we, this, the science fiction stuff that keeps coming through. And to me, that's, you know, and I'm a big Trekkie, the holodeck uh, on in Star Trek, you know, where you'd go in and experience that. To me, I think that's kind of it because we have the compute power now. Um, IoT and this messaging gives you the ability to actually talk to things and put logic into things to have them react to you. And those things can be images. They can be holograms. They, all they got to need is data coming back and that that loop is, is closing. And I think the entertainment industry, um, 20 years from now, I think we're going to be, and I, you know, I, I do not want to die before I go to my first holographic movie, right, where I'm actually sitting amongst the, in the, in the movie and, and watching that and experiencing that. Um, I mean, I think that's will, I mean, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm also not going to participate in because, <laughs> because it's so far, it's, it's a, probably so far out there that um, uh, I'd be, I'll be wasting my twilight years on chasing something that I'm not going to get to see too much, but that's the one that I, I think is most fun. So Rob, you were, you were talking about the sum a, a little bit, but can you go in more detail about how Think Logic got started, what, the, what you're focused on now with the company and what's, what's the vision or future plans for the company is? Yeah, so we, um, like I said, we got started around, you know, because of the acquisition. So once Amazon acquired um, telemetry, we spun off Think Logics to, do professional services around um, IoT, and it kind of grew up around there. Um, we we started, you know, we realized that we had to build a IoT configuration product because um, it was just you just don't want to go in and start rebuilding everything from the ground up on every professional services, and we had to compete with the Accentures and Deloitte's and Capgemini's of the world and um, if we walk in, they're going to walk in with an army. We have to walk in with the with the um, with the problem half solved uh, in order to compete with those sites. So that's how how uh, Foundry and the Thing Logics IoT platform started to evolve. Uh, where it's heading now, uh, we have just announced that we're open open sourcing the whole thing. So um, we have decided to take our entire platform, open source it, so that um, uh, a um, development can continue on this um, cloud of cloud platforms. Uh, we want to do more Azure. We want to do more Google. We want to bring more of that in there, but also uh, to eliminate the barrier uh, of entry for starting to do these new business models. Um, a lot of times what our biggest complaint was when we got into a company, um, we had a smart home system our pricing model was on a per device you know, model. Like, you know, you give me, you know, 25 cents for every device that chirps up. Well, that works really well on the first 10,000 devices, but once you get to a million, it doesn't work so well for the business anymore. Um, so our, our, we've changed our model. Um, we're open sourcing the entire platform. So you can actually take our cloud formation templates, install it into your own AWS account and you're up and running and you have a, a configurable IoT application that you can start um, developing and extending. And then our business model is really going to go more towards, you know, stay on professional services and support for those next training, um, you know, developer um, conferences, being able to teach people how to do these, um, how to develop these um, event driven uh, applications, because that's really at the heart of what um, ThingLogic is. It's an event driven application versus the old request response, request response. So who's your, who's your market for this? Like enterprise companies, startups, individuals, who's your, like your target market, I guess. So our, our customers are, have a wide range. And, you know, I've, I've always, you know, I always tried to stay in the sm uh, small to mid-sized customers. Cause I, uh, we thought, I mean, small to mid-sized companies because uh, we thought they had a, a better fit for us because typically they didn't have all the I, I, uh, IT resources that were necessary, we can provide them a huge uh, jumpstart in whatever, you know, kind of business they're trying to um, get started. Because like I say, we're showing up with 80% of your application already done. And it's the last 20% you have to build with the, but the US government, the USGS is one of our customers. Um, so they use it to monitor 
uh, we monitor snow geese and ducks and river flows, Grand Canyon. They're starting to monitor volcanoes with it, um, monitoring all the collecting all that data from all those different types of sensors. So it's it's and with the the large um, enterprise customers, they always had a bit of a uh, a blocker with us because uh, typically IT would come in and we'd say, okay, well you, we could install this in the way you would go and you'd start doing it. And IT's response was, well, I can build that. Well, yeah, you can. I mean, it's going to take you six months to a year to get, you know, even close to where we could be you in, you know, the next 30 minutes. Um, but now I think with the, as we open source this and we um, get it out, I think it's um, that blocker is going to be removed because now enterprise customers can install Foundry and be up and running with their initiatives and they can um, save an enormous amount of resources and times and getting applications going and doing POCs. So Amazon themselves is actually starting to, Amazon Processional Services has started to adopt uh, Foundry to do their POCs. Uh, we can POC an application, you know, in a matter of hours. Um, and so being able to get that up, see, let the customer see what it's gonna look like, how it's gonna react. But then the POC becomes the actual application. So in this particular case, because it's all serverless and runs on Amazon, it's um, the POC is um, once if you say, yeah, I like that, then you're you're done, you're ready to go. So the time to market is really um, our advantage on that. So it's typically been small to mid-sized companies, but um, we're seeing a lot more bigger ones come in now too. Has being in the Bay Area been an advantage or disadvantage to the company? <laughs> it was an advantage five years ago. It's becoming a disadvantage, I think, in my opinion. And that's a bit of a religious discussion too. Uh, you're seeing an exodus from the Bay Area. You know, HP left, Oracle left, um, Air is leaving, Tesla's leaving, um, and they're all going to Texas. Uh, you're seeing your, you know, uh, the political uh, environment is 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 too unstable. You know, it doesn't matter which side you're on. It's just it's just unstable. It's not. And, um, you know, I think you're seeing, you know, I'm kind of, you know, I, I don't think Salesforce would ever leave the Bay Area. I think Benioff is, he's a, I think he's third or fourth generation San Franciscan. And uh, so he'll, he'll never leave, but, you know, and Apple is pretty well in, in drenched in there, but then I never thought HP would leave either. Um, so it used to be an advantage. You had to be in Silicon Valley, I would say 10 years ago. It's like you had to be there. If, in, if you weren't, you weren't. You weren't playing in the tech game, but I think the pandemic and politics have are changing that. So um, we actually are looking at moving the headquarters to Boston, or no, sorry, Boston, uh, Boise, uh, Idaho. Um, so, uh, and there's a lot of technology happening in Boise. So uh, Boise, Austin are becoming these kind of new Silicon Valleys where people are leaving. So it's not as important as it used to be. Uh, and it's becoming less important. And if the current trends continue, I think it will become kind of irrelevant to be there. So Rob, how do you make sure you take care of yourself? What do you do for that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, uh, I, I, I exercise uh, I, every morning. I, I get up and I do, uh, I do some physical exercise. I, um, I try to always take um, some time and it's usually early in the morning or in the evening, usually sunrise or sunset, you know, when you're out and, and that's typically when I'm out uh, farming and take a few moments. Um, I had mentioned, I, I am a religious man. So I'm, you know, my faith is important to me. And um, so I do that and spending time with my, you know, I have six kids and I try and make the rounds. They all have started to live in different spots now. Um, so last week I, did the, I did the milk run. I say, you know, went to San Francisco and saw my son in Seattle, saw my daughter and, and my other two daughters were here in Bend. I saw them and, and just spend some time with them. Uh, you know, and, you know, as much time as we can, my wife and I, you know, try to get away periodically uh, just to, you know, decompress. I uh, do, I do take two, uh, one week every year um, and I do a complete unplug. Um, no cell, no internet, no nothing. I run a, my buddy and I, we've been doing it for 20, our 22nd year, I think we did. We run a camp for uh, middle school and high school kids. Uh, 
uh, it's a ropes challenge course, you know, kind of take them out in the woods and, you know, teach them to swing on trees and, you know, kind of that overcome problem solving and trust and those kinds of things. And that week, uh, I just completely unplug and focus on, on me and, and helping the kids. And that seems to really re-energize me too. So those are some of the things. And I, you know, they also say, you know, the guy who loves his work never works a day in his life. Yeah. So, so yeah. that's true too. So how, how far is a drive in a car from Bend to the Bay area? It's about eight hours, eight hours. That's not, that's not horrible. No, uh -uh. that's it's about six hours to Seattle. Okay. Um, is there anything I, I should have asked you that you want to talk about or anything in, in, else you want to talk about that we haven't discussed already? Well, Jason, you have been the most thorough uh, <laughs> interviewer I have ever had. So I don't, I, I think you have discussed things that I didn't even know I was going to talk about. So <laughs> no, I don't think there's anything left. So I really do appreciate your thoroughness. Thanks. And I've, I've got to ask you this in a pre-talk, but we're going to get any kind of gift or resource to give away. Like some people like give a discount on what they, what they're selling or like, you know, free time with them. I mean, some people do, some people don't. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, I mean, I would, I would be happy to have a, a free consultation. Um, you know, I'll give you, you know, an hour with anybody to go over, talk about maybe where your IOT solution is, what it could be, how your business might be able to change. What's, you know, cost was came. So happy to do that. Um, uh, also, you know, uh, like I say, we have, this is, you know, we've just recently announced it like a month ago, uh, help you get started with the open sourcing of our platform. We can give you some free training around that. Um, and I, probably the biggest one right now, we got um, uh, the, our, our product Chirply to do SMS management and SMS mark, um, uh, communications. Um, I'd be happy to get that installed and show you how the advantages. That one actually came up quite by accident. I was um, in my beef business. I was trying to, you know, I had I would email my customers and see if they were ready for more ground beef or whatnot. And it just got to be too much. I'd send out an email and I'd get one percent response, and I would then go back and forth on email, and they wouldn't see the email when I sent it to delivery, and um, then they would miss the link. And I finally, I said, I'm not going to do this, and I just. I started using our, our own platform and I started sending SMS messages to my customers and saying, Hey, would you like some, are you ready for some more beef? And the response was immediate and I got 30% response. And even, even I'd get no, not right now. And even the ones that I got said, stop texting me. Those were great because now I know I don't have to worry about managing them and, and they're not my customers. And so when I realized how the, how much the efficiency of communicating with my cu customers over SMS, we started building up Chirply to, to do that for other customers. And that's kind of what it is. So if you want to interested in seeing how SMS can change, how you manage your customers, your customer relationship, happy to get you an installation of that and get you started on that for uh, free for a few days as well. Rob, can you share your social media, social media links for you and your company so people can reach out to you? Um, yeah, so you, uh, uh, Rob at Rast or, sorry, Rob at thinglogics.com, um, send me an email, but you can, you know, also, you know, uh, SMS me 805-207-7027. I don't mind anybody sending me a text message. Um, and, uh, also you can reach out on the website and, uh, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram as well. And for our listeners, we'll have his link to his gifts and his, uh, social media on cell notes. You'll find the show notes at www.cabinetstalkblog.com and be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this episode or to the Jason Cabinet Experience and be sure to share this episode. So Rob, we're coming to the end of this talk. Can you give us any advice or wisdom or, or anything you want to talk about? You know, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not one to, uh, to wax poetically, um, <laughs> but I, I would say um, probably the most important thing that, that I do every day is just be grateful and be thankful for what we've got. Um, and I would say start each day like that and you'll, you'll see great changes in your life, whether it's technology or farming. Rob, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Jason, thanks for having me. It's been really a great experience. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.